Welcome to Breaking Par with Bernard Sheridan, the golf podcast that interviews the best and brightest minds in the golf industry. Now, here's your host, Bernard Sheridan. Michael, welcome to Breaking Par. Thanks so much for being with us today and uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. Well, thanks for having me. So um, you got a you got a picture of Einstein behind you there, and uh, we were uh, just chatting a little bit before um, we went on the air, and I said it's very appropriate because I feel that you guys have a lot in common. <laughs> well, thank you. I, this is our Einstein conference room here at Blast Motion, so he makes me look good. That's pretty good. So, um, so I mean, and I, I don't think you need a lot to make you look good, Michael. I mean, you, you've 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 had some 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 wonderful accomplishments uh, to to and contributions to the game, um, which are used by very many, and um, I'm sure helping a tremendous amount of golfers throughout the world uh, become better players. Um, but before we dig into all of that. Uh, what we always like to ask everybody when they come on the show is, what is the very first time you picked up a golf club? Wow. Um, you know, it's funny. Um, just looking at some family videos not too long ago. So early in the diapers. So out on the front lawn, you know, hitting the, the plastic balls around when I was still in diapers. So I'm guessing, you know, four or five years old, somewhere in that range. So, so young, very young. Very young, yes. Yeah, and and when was the when was the time that the aha moment popped into your head and said, "Hey, you know what? You know, I I maybe I want to do this for a living." You know, I, my my father was a PGA golf professional, um, so I was around golf, you know, ever since I was I was walking, and uh, you know, I always loved hanging out with dad and hanging out with my grandfather and. Um, my brother got into golf, so we were into junior golf just as fun. Um, and then my brother and I both got into racing very seriously with my grandfather. And golf was just kind of fun to go hang out with dad. So uh, it really wasn't the first passion. First passion was racing. And then um, as I got older and, and did the, the racing spiel and then got into golf a little bit more, so that was kind of in my early 20s, I felt that maybe I could do something with golf and was able to still play at a fairly high level and, and you know, went through. The, the junior levels and then went into the mini tour levels and then able up on the professional levels. So um, I was able to play at a decent level and, and still had the bug and still have it today. Uh, what what made you start to get involved in um, in tinkering with, with things um, to put together products that were really extremely innovative? I mean, was your racing days and things that you did in racing kind of a, a catalyst to that? It was. So my grandfather had a, a speed shop in Napa, California, and so I, I kind of grew up, you know, all around, kind of just crawling around the, the grease and the, the nuts and the bolts. So it was, uh, you know, it was a great way to grow up and learn mechanics at a very, very young age. Um, you know, I was hanging around uh, adults, so I was very young, but being able to understand and how to, to learn how to think, how to organize my patterns uh, at a very young age. So it was really cool to start tearing apart things and then learning how to put things together. So at a very young age, I started learning the mechanics and learning how to measure. Um, so we had all these, these great technologies in the racing world that we could measure. And then as I got more involved in the golf world, there was ways of not measuring. So it was kind of like, Dad, here's an 8-millimeter camera. Best of luck to you, kid. That's, that's go look what you see what you see. So that's really was, was really answering the question of why. Why can we not measure? Um, and then building technologies to be able to measure. So, you know, back in the, the late, early 80s and, and 90s, uh, there really wasn't, other than high-speed video, um, which took us, you know, weeks to put together, it just wasn't uh, available to the golf professional or to the professional athlete. And uh, so what made you decide, so your first, I want to say, was KVEST your first product that you, that you, uh, put together or were there or were there other things that happened before that that we just don't know about yeah there's there's many other failures before KVS for sure um like anyone you know you fail a lot of times and you start to learn um so prior to KVS we had powerlink 3d which was a video based system um and we were doing that with chris welch and and peak which was uh vicon years ago 
and the ability to be able to digitize the joint centers of the body and measure. The problem is it took us, you know, two to three days to get this data back. So it was very hard to, to grab the information and then very hard to analyze the information down to where I can speak to a golf professional or a professional athlete, uh, whoever happens to be trying to communicate with. So it was very complex information. The information was there, the signatures were there, they are today, it just took a long time to get them. Yeah, so then the downtime there was really um, kind of probably as fast as the web was when it first came out. I and mean, it would take you forever yeah. to load something or upload or download something. It would be maybe a day. Um, it is. Yeah, and, so, uh, this is pre-web, so this was there was no real you know public access to the web, and uh, so it was you know being able to throw it through UPS or when FedEx came along, you know we could move a little bit faster. So it was it was very tedious, but you really learn the information really well, and then being able to communicate the information was always the goal. So you know I would put many guys to sleep trying to show them the the kinetic graphs or the kinematic sequence, whatever it was. Um, but as soon as we brought video up, everyone wakes up. So we knew early on we had to find a better way of communicating. So all we did was, took us a few years, but to put together the simple two-dimensional video along with the three-dimensional data. And as long as we can sync those two together, we could tell a story. And, and I think that with KVEST, uh, another really great innovation was the tone um, and understanding um, once once the student would get into a certain position, uh, then an audible tone would happen and the color would change. And so now they're getting that. And I guess that's, you know, you saw that video, that need for video um, because people responded to that more. And then when, now that you see something, now, now you have a visual that people can respond to and also an auditory that they can respond to. Um, and, and it really can help accelerate the learning process. Exactly, and that was, we learned that with, um, so we started uh, in the late 90s with electromagnetic, which gave us the information really quickly. Um, the problem is, what was the information? So we did simple X's on the board and just put the X in the box, and if the X got in the box, then we gave you a tone. And as soon as we started doing that, we could change the athlete very quickly. So even we had beginner athletes going through golf schools, we could put a sensor on their pelvis, and even though it was wired, we could get the information to them very quickly and then they changed their pattern right away. So we knew that we were on to that process of how do we make the feedback loop even quicker? And that was the beginning stages of KVAS. So we knew that we wanted that real-time biofeedback. We knew that we wanted video, but we needed to be wireless. So we had to get you outside of the lab and get you out in the real world. And that was really the, the catalyst of KVAS. I think the thing that, and, and I don't use KVAS myself um, because we don't have that at our uh, there is a gentleman who does use KVEST at our facility who uses it mainly for um, uh, understanding biomechanics. Um, he's, the bio, he's one of the biomechanic fitness guys. Um, and he also uses that you know, for, for when they're doing positions in the golf swing as an evaluation. Um, but, but what I always thought, um, what I really liked about KVEST was that you could immediately see um, a difference in posture uh, throughout the swing and and kind of like measure that so that a student would know whether they're losing their posture where they're losing their posture um, information like that and I think that's super valuable um, in being able to strike the ball and and get that swing bottom forward and all those important things yeah so you know like we said the, the, the faster we can get the feedback to the athlete and not try and verbalize it to them um, we see changes happening much quicker. So with our professional athletes or beginner athletes here, it's, it's all about real-time biofeedback. And you know, KVEST is still one of the best products out there, putting the sensor on the pelvis, thorax, whatever it is, and just allow that athlete to be able to feel in real time the way they're moving. And the faster we get that feedback, the faster the change. And we don't confuse them with whatever the verbiage that we're trying to describe it. So you know, what does peanut butter taste like to this athlete? I can't tell them that but I can show them, here's where I want the orientation of the pelvis to be, you tell me what it feels like, and it feels different, it feels funny, it feels tight, it feels loose, whatever it is, now they understand that feel, and then they can put a picture to it in their mind and repeat that pattern over and over again. Yeah, I think that those two things, that, that, um, that the actual feel that a player has 
and then the visual um, I want to say uh, verification of what they're doing when they see when both of those things happen together now can really accelerate the learning process and and of course in golf and especially today um, with all the crazy technology that we have out there and and being able to get everything almost instantly when we want it um, players expect that they expect to have a, a faster results to learn the game to get better quicker um, than than years before um, whereas they they had a little bit more patience when they were um, in the eight, in the 70s and 80s I think there was a lot more patience in the way players uh, progressed in their game and now I see players especially as an instructor they want to see huge changes within like within like um, you know a couple of weeks which is right. which is really impossible but yeah. but but what what happens with with the type of things that you're producing is that they can see changes much quicker and and maybe they might not be huge effectiveness on their scores um but they can definitely start to see big changes in a very short period of time and that's and that's a major um improvement over what has happened and it also i believe um keeps people wanting to come back um because a lot of people when they don't see the results that they want quick enough then they're kind of like i'm out of here um and and that can either get them out of here from whoever they're working with to go to somebody else or maybe i'm out of here totally i'm not going to take lessons anymore i'm going to try to figure this out for myself which just leads to a higher frustration level agreed yeah yeah and it's like you said it's the faster we can give someone a road map of here's where they are and here's where they need to be um to to reach that level of proficiency that they're after, that's the advantage of real-time feedback. So we can do, you know, as we improve our, our knowledge of motor learning, like you're saying, and not promising athletes to change in, in you know, five hours. Um, you know, someone that has a, any kind of a medical problem, we don't expect them to be back in three minutes. So, you know, in, in the real world, in the golf world that we're playing in, it, it takes time to change those patterns. But if we understand the biomechanics we can get those changes to happen very quickly and put them on a roadmap and then monitor them and measure them as they go along. Right. I mean, I think, too, a lot of people don't realize that uh, the neuron pathways that are built in the brain, um, they're, they're pretty solid. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and to reprogram them is not that easy. It, it takes time Correct. Uh, to build those new pathways. And, and it's, it's uh, I mean, because we're dealing with organics here. Um, and and uh, you just can't get the brain to, to build brand new pathways right away immediately. But but with things like this and what you're doing, they're accelerating that process tremendously. So let's get down to the latest product that that's out right now that you've been involved in, and that's Blast Motion. And and my first question with that is, how long um, was it when you came up with this idea before it actually came to market? Yeah, so we, we had the inception of it. So we were working uh, with Vicon, and we were building a, a motion capture system that was designed for the OEM. So the OEMs wanted to look at the club head or the golf shaft deflection, the golf ball. Um, but the complexity of the software was too high to allow the engineers to understand how to, how to run it. So we had to make that much simpler. So Vicon brought me in to help them with what we call the Enzo system now that's most of the OEMs use to look at the club head or the golf shaft deflection. So that was the early stages and we knew that we needed to go back to the inertial sensor which was the, the KBES to get it much smaller and, and much more affordable um, to really make the change in the golf world or athletics as we were looking at. Um, so that was early, so it was 2007, 2008 we were really starting to to know where the, the inertial systems were starting to go. Um, as the iPhones and the, the laptops were now getting smaller and using the same type of technology, we were able to leverage that. So we got together with the team here and, and, and formed Blast really in the 2009 area. Um, and then started to miniaturize the sensor. So how can we get the sensor small enough, but it still needed to be that military or tactical grade that KVS was. Um, to get the accuracy that, that was necessary. So the OEMs were pushing us as, how do we get it small enough we can put it on a golf club? 
So we had to get something, you know, less than 15 grams um, that really wasn't going to affect the, the golf club where the golfer really felt like the shaft completely um, had a different frequency to it as soon as you added all that mass. So it was in that stages, and then it took us a few years to, to keep miniaturizing it um, and coming up with the manufacturing process to keep that tactical grade sensor where we wanted it. Um, and then we were able to you know, start doing a lot of testing with the OEMs, so that kind of gets us in 2010, 2012, um, and it kept moving to where it is today. How big was the sensor when you first have developed it? Was it the same size as the one that they have on K-Vest? Uh, no, it actually we started, uh, it was in the golf shaft. So we oh, okay. started it very small um, inside the golf shaft, um, but the USGA didn't allow us to be in the golf shaft. So we had to pull it back out of the golf shaft, retool it. Um, this is kind of the second space, and it had to be removable with a tool. So that was the early stages of what the USGA wanted us to, to have the sensor on the golf club. Um, so then it got pinned down to the button size, which was small enough that we can remove it, put it in. It also worked as a form factor for other sports that we were looking at. Yeah, I mean, it's actually like smaller than the size of a quarter. Um, it is. And, uh, and just uh, has a little um, rubber uh, holder that clips onto the top of the shaft, uh, the back of the butt end of the grip. And, and then it just links up to, to your iPhone or your, you know, whatever your smartphone is. And, uh, and then starts to read out all that information, um, which is really um, not only innovative, but, uh, but the, the thing that, that really I think is awesome about this product is the affordability to this, the masses and the consumers. Because if a uh, golf professional has this device and is using it to measure information with his students, it's affordable enough for the student to purchase one too and then for them to start to look at that information on their own and um, actually on the golf course, which really is, uh, to me, uh, a remarkable innovation because now what we're doing is we're seeing exactly what they're doing in, real, in the real world as opposed to what they're doing when they're with us in a lesson studio or, or on the lesson tee. Yeah, and that was, you know, the, the original incentive was, was how do we make this affordable? So the sensor, you know, used to cost us thousands of dollars to manufacture, um, and not everyone can afford that. So for us to really make a change in all sports, we had to make it affordable, you know, that the father of little Johnny could, could afford this product, um, and that was a, a hard task. So we, we put the, the engineering team together, and they came up with a concept that we can manufacture this in masses, yet still have that tactical grade quality that was necessary to be able to, to use it with an OEM and go out there and work with a product like a TrackMan or some Vicon or some of the other devices out there. So, you know, a lot of our professional athletes and a lot of our coaches use this with other technologies and it had to have that military grade quality, uh, yet it had to be extremely affordable. So that's what we have today, which is pretty amazing feat, as you said. Um, and in, in being able to work with the other different OEMs to make it affordable, they can put it in their products. You must be very proud uh, of, of what you've produced uh, to, br to bring to fruition to the golf world. I mean, um, it's really quite remarkable. You're, you know, it, I wasn't kidding when, with, when, I, when I made the, I, when the Einstein reference there. Well, you know, it's, it's all about the team. Um, and you surround yourself with, with a great team and you can do some phenomenal things. And, and what we have coming down the pipeline here at Blast is pretty amazing. Um, our team gets stronger and stronger every week. Um, so we got a great executive team, we got a great engineering team, and together we're able to really make some changes in the world. And you know, now what we've been doing in baseball is pretty amazing. If you see what's, what's happening there, not in the, the major league level, but also in the minor league level. So it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, and again, as we keep making great products, we keep surrounding ourselves with better individuals. Who knows what the future is going to look like? Yeah, well, we're making, uh, with what you're doing, it's, it's uh, making sports better and, and, and easier to understand and for athletes to play it at, at the highest level that they've ever been capable of um, with this technology. You know, there's a lot of um, people who, who still, unfortunately, um, sh shy away from technology or bash technology. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that uh, I've always embraced technology. Uh, before I got into uh, the golf business, I was an audio engineer um, and worked in that field for 30 years. 
and and I always embraced every new technology that was out there because I believe that if it can help the athlete um, or or anybody uh, do whatever it is to do it more efficiently and more effectively and and quicker, um, then it's got to be good. Uh, I think that what a lot of these uh, people who bash this technology is is that they are bashing the part that um, they're confusing the client um, with technology. But I believe that if the technology is um, introduced at a level, uh, and a good example is BLAST, that um, it's not super overly complicated where uh, the layman can start to study it a little bit and understand it. They may not want to get into it as deeply as an instructor would because that's what they do. Um, but, um, but I think that, that making it simpler, um, it makes it better for the client, uh, at, but also the complexity in it, um, it makes it better for the instructor or the coach or whoever, whoever is looking at this information and really understands it. Um, really exactly what's happening and what's going on and what they need to do to convey to their student to change that. Um, and they don't have to tell them everything. And that's the whole thing. Right. See, I think a lot of these guys who bash the technology, they think that that the instructors who are using it, all they're doing is using numbers and saying, well, this number's here and you need to be at this number. Um, and that's not true. Right. Yeah, I think, it, you know, with any tool, it, it can be a hammer. It, it's not about the hammer. It's not about the tool. We are very proud of the tool that we build, but it's about how do you communicate how to use that tool. And as you said, is is what is the actual information necessary for this particular athlete at this particular time? So maybe it's just talking about a clock. Okay, well, I want to work on my timing. Why is that important? And just give them the information to help you communicate better to that athlete. So if we can just talk about time, great. If we can talk about maybe another derivative of time. We can talk about speed, excellent. We can talk about acceleration, excellent. So again, what does the athlete really need at this particular time? And, and I've been guilty of, I think we all have, of, of giving too much information um, and we overload the student. So really understanding more about the motor learning, what is really necessary for this athlete to make a change in their pattern and to be able to measure that pattern so we can then manage that pattern. And again, a tool like BLAST really helps you measure that pattern and then be able to manage that pattern so again it's not about the tool but it's about how to use that tool and we try and educate the best we can our instructors and our staff of how to use the tool more efficiently and the better we get at using our tool the better we get at communicating the faster we make changes in those patterns now tell us a little bit about timing and and uh, because you did mention timing and and let's say uh, uh the blast motion in putting and how timing and the ratio of timing between the backswing and the, and the forward swing um, uh, really affects uh, the, the way that the player puts. Yeah, so it's, you know, if you kind of start breaking it down into the principles, going back to, to Einstein, it's, it's, it's making it as simple as possible without being simpler. So if I want to look at timing and understand why is timing important and I really go down to it's all about creating force with this golf club um, if it's a putter if it's a driver whatever it happens to be we tell the story very easily with putting and a lot of us think that the product only does putting but it's just it's it's how we tell the story so what we're after is is how we're changing speed so simplify how we're changing speed we look at time so time is an element and distance is an element and how are you changing that time? How are you changing that speed? So what we find out very easily is, again, we understood it from a physics standpoint. So we went out to the real world and we just captured a lot of data on the best players in the world. So we have over 200 players using our product on a weekly basis and we don't pay any of our players to use our product. They use the product because it's a great clock, right? That the, it measures timing really well. So if I understand how to measure time, then I can start to understand how I can measure speed and then the change in speed. So in putting, what we want to look at, or in the full swing, we want to look at this time signature. And everyone has their own signature. Um, if I look at golf and I say, okay, most putters out there are probably in the range of 33 to 35 inches long. Most golfers are somewhere in the range of you know, 5'10 to 6 foot tall. 
we kind of deal with the same lever. So if we look at that lever and model it against something that we know like a clock, so a pendulum, so we look at that grandfather clock swinging back and forth, it has a mass on the end of that lever, the lever stays the same, which would represent the golf club and the body together creates this lever. And how that lever moves back and through never changes, the ideal situation. So we, that's why we talk a lot about posture. So there's the, the top of this clock and the bottom of the clock, this lever. And as this lever swings in space, we want that lever to stay the same length. That stays the same length and the time is gonna stay the same. So it, it kind of gives us a backdoor way of talking about posture and talking about stability without even having to get into it. So as simply as, hey, here's a clock. Let's see what your time is for a three foot putt, a six foot putt, a 12 foot putt, a 50 foot putt. Is the time the same? If it is not, then we need to deal with the issue of why not. If it is the same, we go, great, congratulations, let's go to the next level and let's look at your speed. But until we get time, we can't really start to work on speed. And once we get speed, then we can start work on accelerations and we can start working at some of the rotations. So at a very simplistic level, as we talk about this force, which is just the mass and the acceleration. So we, we look at that and say, okay, how am I looking at the change in velocity and the change in time? I'd like to see time to stay consistent and I just change my speed. So how do we simplify this, this mathematics? And not everyone went through calculus or went through mathematics in school. True. And that's fine. We're not talking about intelligence. We're talking about experience. So we as coaches that understand this need to simplify it enough that anyone can understand. We need to be able to speak the same language and kind of get rid of the $10 words and say, okay, here's what we're talking about. I want this time to be the same for your short putts and your long putts, and let's go test it. So we go into the lab, we go out on the putting green, and we test is your time being the same. If it is, great. That means that you got some pretty good stability. That means your posture is pretty good and you're consistent with using the force of the backstroke and the forward stroke. If it's not, then we need to address it. Now, our best players in the world are still vibrating somewhere in the range of two to three hundredths of a second. We like to get them down to a couple thousandths of a second, and that's what the human body can do, and they do it in other sports. We just don't have the, the feedback of, if my timing is off in racing, I usually crash. If my timing's an off in putting, I usually just miss the putt. So, really understanding what that timing is and how do I be consistent with it, how do I repeat it? And blast having that very accurate clock is a great way of measuring time. Now, now a question of, of, you mentioned posture, and, and I had a discussion with a few pros and I asked them, uh, it, it, how did they think posture affected timing and uh, what did they think affected timing? And I got varying, varying different answers. Um, most did not think that posture affected timing at all, and they thought that pressure, like grip pressure, would affect right. timing and things like that. So, and you say posture, so, so how how does posture have a stronger effect? Let's just say in the putting stroke, just keep this simple. Mm -hmm. um, uh, has a stronger effect in the timing ratio than let's say grip pressure, and and why is that? Yeah, so if I kind of look at the, the mathematics and I look at a pendulum and I, and I look at the top of the pendulum and the bottom of that pendulum, and the top being that, that axis point that everything's going to move around, if that stays constant, stays stable, and this swings, it doesn't matter if the magnitude is small or the magnitude is large, the time stays the same. The only thing that affects time is the length of the lever. So the length of lever could be like someone feels grip pressure change and what they are really feeling is the force coupler or the, the handle yep. is changing its length in relationship to the body. And let's just say that the top of the spine, you know, cervical vertebrae number seven here, it's just as a reference of that's where it's swinging from. And if that stays stable and is allowed to be mobile, as it moves around, that length of the lever doesn't change. So a small putt or a large putt this time stays the same. So time does not get affected by magnitude. So a small putt, large putt, time doesn't change. What changes time is the length of the lever. So that's what gets us focusing on, well, something is going on with the length of the lever. So somewhere the lever has changed. So either you've broken down the lever, we, you know, some guys will say, well, I went forward with the hands, I flipped the hands, I lifted the hands, whatever that change is, that's changing the length of that lever. 
but what we feel as golfers is we don't really feel changes as far as the length of the lever. Because they're minute, correct? Pressure, yeah, I have less pressure. That's what we feel as humans. And it's not that the human is not feeling that because they're being honest with us and feeling it. They just don't feel the change or are not aware of, hey, what's about the change of the length of the lever. So the mathematics helps us there. Again, helps us measure what really changed. So then I can say, well, then how'd you do with your speed? What was your backstroke speed and your forward stroke speed? How did you change that speed? And was there any symmetry between the backstroke and the forward stroke as far as speed? Did time stay the same? Did it change? So again, these are all measuring points that we can get super complex, but then how do we tell the simple story to the golfer, to the coach? I go back to is my time is changing, check their posture. And when I say posture, it's not just the body, it's what the That's arms are doing in relationship to where they were. Are they traveling on that same path? Are they raising? Are they lowering? Are they getting more forward or ahead or behind or inside or outside or or any of those things? So so if, if I could keep my posture um, exactly the same and change my grip pressure, would it affect and, and not change not change the coupler, like ch- only change the coupler's strength but not change the length of the lever, would it affect my timing? No. No. Okay, so that, that's, that's, the, that's the question that I, that I wanted to ask. Yeah. Because I know that I sat in on the seminar, and uh, that, that was not that long ago. I think it was the last week. Um, and uh, because I'm very interested in this product. And uh, we use it at, at Impact Zone Golf, and, and I think it's a fine product. So, but... Um, and and that posture was 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 mentioned, so I wanted to dive a little bit deeper into that with this conversation because I can, and I really couldn't do that um, in the middle of a seminar. I don't want to be the guy who's typing a hundred questions there um, and asking all these questions and holding up the seminar, as opposed to this is my show and I can do whatever the heck I want. <laughs> yeah. So with your background, it's all about waveforms, right? Yeah. So that's all we're talking about here. We're talking about a waveform. Um, and if I just can, can help the golfer understand what the waveform is for the putting stroke. So I have the guys kind of imagine that I have a pin that's on the end of my putter and I have a piece of paper that's just kind of rolling in front. So as this pendulum moves back and forth and the piece of paper goes forward, it creates a waveform. And that's all we're looking for. Sure. So to answer your question, what changes that waveform right what's that wave that we're looking at then we can start to understand it's like well the length of the lever does have a change in that time or frequency right so we can look at the length of the lever and we can then look at how you're applying that energy that force to move that that lever now if I stall it will it change the waveform yes it will it will flatline it out so you could I mean when I say that the main issue of, of time is posture. Now you could, again, break it and just say, well, I'm just gonna hang on to this thing. But to hang on to it and not change the lever is fairly difficult. I won't say it's impossible, but mechanically- I, I agree, I agree with that. I, I mean, but but I think that, that the point here is that when we talk about grip pressure, um, we're, we're talking about slight variations in grip pressure, yes. I think is what we really mean. Not like I'm strangling the heck out of the thing and, right. and, I, and it's about, about to fall out of my hands. Because right. um, not nobody does either one of the, well, I have seen some students who strangle the heck out of it. Uh, they're more beginner students and they're trying to really control what's going to happen. So they were really, really tight. Um, so my reference to them is I give them a ball a golf ball and I put it in their hand and I say how hard are you going to hold this golf ball if you're going to roll it to that hole if you're going to mm-hmm. throw it how are you going to hold it as tight as you're holding that grip and they'll go oh my god no and I say well then there you go that's how yeah. tight you should be holding it um, yeah. and and that's just for a fact that I found that if they're a little bit more relaxed the body can move a little bit more fluidly and uh, and the levers can work a lot better and, and more efficiently. Um, yeah. But of course, if they change their posture, they're changing the length of the lever, as you said, and that can have a huge effect. And that's the same um, with if you were measuring with uh, chipping or pitching or full swing or a driver. Correct. 
Yeah, so then as we get more complex, that there's the, the, the chemical and elastic energy in the system, the body, you know, how it moves, it will have some time element to it as it transfers that, that angular energy, right? So as we, we look at how it transfers that momentum, um, it, it will change time. So we can see that here's the length of the lever with a driver, here's the length of the lever with a, with a wedge, what is the change? So the lever changes, the frequencies, the sine wave changes, and our goal as golf coaches, as players, is, is trying to keep that sine wave within our signature. So backstroke, forward stroke, doesn't matter what the club is, um, how am I doing with my time? So we go back to is, is measure first, how do I do with my timing? Today it feels fast, it feels slow, whatever it feels, great, calibrate yourself. And now I know where I'm at. So if I have a driver and I hit it 25% versus a driver 100%, the time should stay the same. So we get pretty much anyone to hit a driver 10%. That's not too hard to find the face. But now when they swing it at 100%, does this time stay the same? And just using it just for a clock alone will change the way they, they hit a golf ball. And usually we struggle with the longer clubs. You know, give someone a four iron or you know five irons. Now there's four and three, two ones are almost obsolete now. So what does it look like when they hit a little chip shot with a four iron or a five iron? And then when they hit a 35% shot or a 50% shot, does the time stay the same? And if it does, they're going to get some pretty good strikes. So here's an idea that I have um, as we were speaking to improve blast motion even further. Um, because you mentioned to me a wavelength. Now, when I think of wavelengths, if I think of a longer wavelength, I think of a lower tone. Mm -hmm. If I think of a higher wavelength, I think of a, of a higher tone. Yes. Now, what would happen if you could incorporate in, in the blast motion um, a tone, like you do in K-Vest, okay, <laughs> that actually changes pitch due to the change in tempo or in timing that if that timing gets faster the pitch goes up and if that timing gets slower the pitch goes down you're on the same page it's pretty cool i mean yeah. and think about that how if if the blast motion did that and made that tone through 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 your phone or or maybe through the device itself mm -hmm. um now all of a sudden uh they uh the unless they're tone deaf which which most people aren't um right. they're going to hear a little variance in a change of tone from what they're used to and they might have to hear an a all the time as opposed to a b or an f yeah. um in 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 the in the actual note that they're hearing that's going to get them right in that realm that most of your most players who are tour pros are in same page. Um, again, exciting stuff. The sonification of these signals and what your ears can pick up on versus what your eyes are picking up on. Um, again, it helps us communicate faster to the athlete. So that's, that's definitely a path that we've been going down. Um, so we'd love to have you come into the lab and play around with some new prototyping. And uh, I would love to do that. I mean, in, you know, being an audio engineer for, for many years, um, those kind of things always held an interest to me. And, um, and audible too i know for me sometimes it's been it's a blessing and a curse at the same time um because like i could be a perfect example is um and it used to bother me when i was when i was younger it doesn't bother me as much now but my ears are so tuned to hearing every little tiny thing that if i was on the golf course in the middle of my backswing i could hear a branch crack or something and it would affect my tempo mm -hmm. um or if I'm at the movies, I can hear people whispering behind me almost over the audio of the film. Yes. And the film is way louder, but the way that my ears work, they're so fine-tuned into different tones and listening for things that are not supposed to be there. Yes. And then making sure that, oh, that was a bad take, or or if it's live, am I, am I hearing a very slight tone of feedback or a tone that is not really optimal? for the best quality audio that we're trying to put out there. So I need to quick pull down 4K or whatever it may be so that that thing's not about to take off. And I can hear that way before the audience even even knows that it's even happening. 
Yes. Um, even though nine out of ten times my uh, the audiences that I that I was dealing with were uh, under the influence of something, <laughs> so they probably couldn't hear it anyway and wouldn't even <laughs> know the difference. It could have been going for a minute, and they probably would have went, "What? What are you talking about?" Um, whereas others, of course, hear it right away. So. So yeah, I would love to, I would love to get involved in that in some way. That I think that that's really cool, and and I think that it, um, if there was a way to do that with the blast motion, um, I don't know how uh, how much more it would affect the cost of the product going forward, um, but I'm sure there's ways to to do that without affecting the cost later on down the line. Yeah, yeah, we we're down that path now, and again, it's it's all about how do we make the athletes change those patterns quicker and how do we communicate better so that sonification is is in the bullseye so it's pretty amazing what you can do with small data as well as big data and again the ears are, are phenomenal they will pick that up well i think too when you're swinging if you, especially if you're putting um you, you can not not have to look at anything just do what you're doing and hear the tone mm-hmm. and just kind of fine tune it yeah. you know <laughs> and dial it in and then once you got the tone dialed in, now now you know that every time you do it, you start to feel that, yes. and you can start to quantify that, and yeah. and this to me is uh, super super interesting stuff. I mean, I'm, yeah. I I just love technology. I love I love uh, finding ways to make players better, and um, and I'm sure it's the same thing in in baseball too, it that is. that could be Definitely. highly effective in in what they do and. And yes. and maybe uh, their their uh, their swing plane too. Uh, you know, are they swinging level? Are they doing it? Because because I'm a huge baseball head too. I mean, I okay. even though um, I'm I'm a loyal fan of the worst team in baseball right now, <laughs> <laughs> which is the Philadelphia Phillies. I hate to say it, guys, but you have the worst <laughs> record in the MLB out of anybody. Um, and and sometimes you know I'll, I'm, I live down here in Florida now. And I'm originally from Philadelphia, and I'll and I'll be wearing Philly, and I'll hear Philly, you know, or whatever, and I'll be like, tell me something that I don't know. So it's every team is terrible in, in the MLB at one time or another. Right. Um, a few years back, the Cubs were the worst team in baseball, um, right. and now they're the best. So, but that's the beauty of baseball, and um, and if you look at golf, it's a lot like that too. You have some of the greatest players who are who are great, but that greatness doesn't stay up there for a very very long time unless you're one of a select few right. um and and things like this product uh can help those players sustain that so so i really appreciate you being on the show today it was an absolute uh wonderful show i mean i i i, I would i could talk to you for hours about this stuff there's no doubt about it so so for players who are interested in getting this product um and for coaches who are interested in in incorporating this product in what they do um, which I highly recommend um, what's the best way for them to do that yeah the easiest way is just go right to the web uh, and go to blastmotion.com um, you can go right there to the cart and you can order the product if you're a PGA professional there's there's a way to go in and use your PGA card and get a discount that way you can make a little bit of money as far as a coach so you're out there you know the w- way for us to change the game is through the coaches so we really embrace the coaches. We help the coaches as much as we can. We have education systems, uh, many different ways that we support the PGA professional and the coaches out there so then they can help those students. So go right to the web. You can order it right there. Uh, if you're just an amateur golfer, that's great. You can order it. If you have a pro, work through your golf professional, and then they can help you along with that, that whole roadmap as we keep moving. Well, Michael, thanks again for, uh, for all your insight uh, to our audience today. And uh, as we always like to say in parting, until we meet again, do your best to keep it in the short grass. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the time. You've been listening to Breaking Par with your host, Bernard Sheridan. Follow us on Twitter at Breaking Par and on Facebook at Par Breakers Golf Academy. Until next week, try to keep it on the short grass.